This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Aviator, war hero, Nazi connections, family scandals, murder. When you hear the name Charles Lindbergh, you likely think of his famed 33-hour flight across the Atlantic. His custom-built plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, is said to have pushed forward the bounds of mechanical aviation, and his expertise was of vital importance to the American military in the Pacific during World War II. Lauded by many as an international hero, Lindbergh's carefully controlled public persona certainly presented him as such. But there was a shady, secretive underbelly to this larger-than-life figure which, in the few moments it exposed itself during his life, it caused him international controversy. The man born Charles Augustus Lindbergh was a pioneer of early aviation, an author, an activist, and a key consultant and combatant for American forces during the height of World War. What many often overlook, as Lindbergh would have wanted, were his isolationist, eugenicist ideals, the mystery kidnapping and death of his infant son, and the eight illegitimate children he fathered with multiple women in Germany. To quote the youngest of these children after Lindbergh's death, this story reflects absolutely Byzantine layers of deception on the part of our shared father. These children did not even know who he was. He used a pseudonym with them to protect them, perhaps to protect himself. Absolutely. Even whilst on his deathbed, Lindbergh wrote letters across the Atlantic urging his mistresses to keep quiet his illicit activities. Decoding fact from fiction is a tightrope walk when examining such a full life, yet even these simple facts are more than surprising in regards to this titan of 20th century culture. Detroit, Michigan, February 4, 1902. Charles Augustus Lindbergh is born to Evangeline Lodgeland Lindbergh, a high school chemistry teacher, and Charles August Lindbergh, who would go on to be a U.S. congressman throughout most of Charles's youth. Representing Minnesota in the House of Representatives, the elder Charles was one of very few congressmen to oppose U.S. entry into World War I. He would go on to write Why Is Your Country at War?, a book critical of U.S. entry into the Great War. The Minnesota representative's minority political views would have unforeseen consequences on his son's life, but but more on that to come. With his parents divorcing when he was seven, Charles moved around often during childhood, never attending any school for more than two years. After graduating high school, Lindbergh began attending engineering school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but he dropped out during his sophomore year and moved to Lincoln, Nebraska to pursue flight training in the spring of his 20th year. Charles had an innate interest in mechanical engineering and airplanes in particular as he reached adolescence, but never had he been exposed to aviation until enrolling in the Nebraska Aircraft Corp. Operations Flying School in Lincoln. Gaining his first flight experience there as a passenger and co-pilot, Lindbergh soon left the school to earn money in order to learn to fly solo. To earn the cash he needed, Lindbergh worked as a barnstormer, performing death-defying aerial stunts such as wing walking on planes mid-air before transitioning into airplane mechanic at the airport in Billings, Montana. By 1923, Lindbergh purchased his first plane for $500, a surplus World War I biplane nicknamed Jenny. Almost immediately, he began flying solo and barnstorming from the Jenny under the moniker Daredevil Charles. After showing off his aerial stunts across the southern U.S. for the next few months, Daredevil Charles decided it was time to commit fully to piloting, so he enrolled in the year-long flight training program offered by the United States Army Air Service in San Antonio, Texas. Early aviation was anything but safe, and only 18 of the 104 who enrolled in the program finished it a year later. Charles was among them, despite suffering a mid-air collision with another cadet during aerial combat maneuver drills just eight days before he was due to graduate. Lindbergh was able to eject and parachute out in time, and fortunately, this would be the most serious accident Charles would have through the rest of his aviation career. Graduating top of his class, Lindbergh earned a commission as a second lieutenant in the Air Reserve Service Corps. Upon completion of his training and their and learning that additional active duty pilots were not needed, Charles returned to civilian piloting as a barnstormer and flight instructor. By participating in a limited fashion in military flights in his spare time, Lindbergh was twice promoted to lieutenant and then to captain by 1926. During this formative period in Lindbergh's life, he also became an ML pilot in order to raise money for a soon-to-be-famed custom-built plane.
A wealthy Parisian businessman living in New York named Raymond Orteig heard about the first successful non-stop transatlantic crossing in 1919, which was completed by a duo of British pilots. The flight was 1,900 miles, an impressive feat, but only about 60% of the distance between New York and Paris. Inspired by this achievement, and wishing for more efficient transport between the two world cities, Orteig put up a prize of $25,000 awarded to the first to fly non-stop between New York and Paris. The prize had a five-year time time limit, and when no one completed this seemingly impossible feat within the allotted time, Ortig renewed the prize for another half decade. By the time Ortig renewed the prize in 1924, a number of well-funded and famous World War I pilots of several nations were attempting this monumental task. Aces from Europe and America alike gave it their best effort, but they all ended in catastrophe and death, exemplifying the perilous nature of undertaking this fatal competition. Charles Lindbergh, a relatively inexperienced and anonymous aviator at the time, caught wind of the prize. Referred to as the Ortig Prize, Lindbergh decided to enter the race despite the stiff competition. Lindbergh found it difficult to secure funding for his goal, but while working on his airmail route between St. Louis and Chicago in 1926, he convinced two St. Louis businessmen to fund his endeavor. Charles felt confident that he could win the Ortig Prize due to his experience in both mechanics and piloting, despite having substantially less financial support than his competitors. San Diego-based Ryan Aircraft Company agreed to build the plane, and it was to be named the Spirit of St. Louis in honor of the financiers. Upon Charles's insistence, they agreed to allow him to co-design the plane as well. The main engineering difference between the Spirit of St. Louis and its competitors was its design with larger fuel tanks and no second seat for a navigator. A two-man team of pilot and navigator made all other attempts at transatlantic crossings, but Lindbergh reassured the uneasy Ryan Aircraft Company that he could handle both jobs by himself. By removing the space for the second seat and replacing it with an extra fuel tank, the Spirit of St. Louis was lighter and had more range than its competitors. Early in 1927, the aircraft was complete, and after some flight tests, including a trip from San Diego to New York, Lindbergh's team deemed the Spirit of St. Louis ready to attempt the transatlantic crossing in May of 1927. That same month, famed World War I flying ace Charles Nungesser and navigator Francois Coley disappeared over the Atlantic, attempting to capture the Ortigue Prize. The loss and presumed death of France's most decorated and famous pilot to date cast further doubt over the less funded and less established Lindbergh attempt. On May 20, 1927, the Spirit of St. Louis, with Charles at the helm, took off from Roosevelt Airfield in New York. Spanning the ensuing 33 and a half hours, a completely alone Lindbergh overcame icy and blind flying conditions, flew above a storm at 10,000 feet and as low as 10 feet over wave tops to avoid the harsh weather of the North Atlantic. Because navigation techniques were unreliable and primitive by today's standards and Lindbergh had no communication with anyone, he relied solely on dead reckoning to estimate his position during the flight. By sheer luck, the winds over the Atlantic Atlantic essentially nullified one another that day, negating any potential wind drift and miraculously keeping Charles on course. Around 33 hours after departing Roosevelt Airfield, a freezing, exhausted, and hungry Lindbergh spotted his intended target of Le Bourget Airfield outside of Paris. Unbeknownst to Charles, a crowd of approximately 150,000 Parisians flocked to the airfield to see him land, and the headlights from their cars acted as a beacon for Lindbergh's safe landing. As soon as he touched down in Paris on the evening of May the 21st, Charles Lindbergh had gone from virtual anonymity to a worldwide aviation hero of unprecedented scale. The level of fame that surrounded Charles Lindbergh was staggering. In a single day, shortly after the heroic flight, New York City hosted a ticker tape parade and then a ceremony for Lindbergh, who was seen in person by some four million people that day. The French Foreign Office flew the American flag in Lindbergh's honor, a symbol of respect reserved solely for foreign heads of state up until that point. In December 1927, Lindbergh was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor by President Calvin Coolidge, an especially flattering sign of respect due to the fact that it was the highest military combat honor one could receive. The following month, time magazine crowns Charles Man of the Year, the youngest ever recipient of such an honor. These are just a few of the many awards that Lindbergh received, a representation of just how much recognition and adulation he received for enhancing the possibilities of aviation. Using his newfound fame and subsequent fortune from speaking tours and penning an autobiography, Charles shifted his focus towards scientific exploration. Lindbergh designed a wristwatch that, when used concurrently with a sextant and nautical almanac, allowed fellow aviators to determine their exact longitude. Charles 
presented its design to the Longines Watch Company, and they began production in 1931. The same Longines navigation watches are produced to this day with GPS navigation, only recently making them obsolete. As a result of his sister-in-law developing a fatal heart condition, Lindbergh became curious about the possibility of performing surgery on the heart. Though such procedures did not exist at the time, Charles studied outside-of-body perfusion procedures with Nobel Prize winner Alexis Carroll. The unlikely duo found the results of their study encouraging and thus developed a glass perfusion pump which Charles nicknamed the Model T Pump in homage to his friend Henry Ford. This glass perfusion pump led to the creation of the first ever heart-lung machine, and it is also widely credited in making future heart surgeries possible. Considering his lack of expertise in the medical field and the impact the Model T pump had on medical advancement, this feat of engineering was perhaps as impressive as Charles's transatlantic crossing five years prior. And if you're looking to do something impressive, well, let me tell you about a great way to get that out to the world. That's with a website with today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now, maybe you've got an idea for a website or a business or a podcast or something knocking around in your mind, and you're like, well, I've been thinking about doing that. Should I do it? Well, the second thing is that the only way to figure out if it's a good idea and if people want to listen to you, to buy your product, whatever, is to make a website and get it out there into the world. And that can be daunting because it's scary to go and pursue new things, but not knowing how to set up a website is not an excuse. There are no excuses available with Squarespace. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. You want to sell something online? Yes. Set up a store with Squarespace. You want to start a podcast? Totally. They do that too. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content, or start from scratch, or move over from an existing domain whatever you like. On Squarespace, everything is easy to manage. And once you've gone through the super easy customization process, there are no updates, there's no patches, there's no tech BS to deal with. And Squarespace also handles all of the website-y stuff. Like I say, they do podcasts, but also mailing lists, social integrations, all of that stuff. There's also 24-7 customer support there to help you if you've ever got a question. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Though Charles Lindbergh was internationally celebrated as a hero, he did not enjoy all the attention that came with his stardom. In order to escape the masses and settle down into family life, Lindbergh purchased an estate in Hopewell, New Jersey. It was here that he intended to raise his first child, Charles Lindbergh Jr., with his wife Anne Morrow Lindbergh. However, on the fateful night of March 1, 1932, 20-month-old Charles Lindbergh Jr. was abducted from his crib at the family estate in Hopewell. The anonymous kidnapping note demanded a $50,000 ransom equivalent to over $900,000 in 2020. In hoping to catch the kidnapper, the ransom was paid with bills with recorded serial numbers and gold certificates soon to be removed from circulation, both of which would attract attention if used by the abductor. Commonly regarded as the crime of the century, media outlets worldwide picked up on the story. Details of the case became increasingly public as time went on, and local and federal police generated thousands of leads for suspects all across the country. Seventy days after Charles Lindbergh Jr. disappeared, his decomposed remains were found in the woods less than five miles from the family estate. The case was far from over, however, as J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Bureau of Investigations, worked closely with the New Jersey State Police to hunt down the murderer. For two and a half years, no suspect was identified as the culprit, but finally the gold reserve notes recirculated and law enforcement linked the notes to Bruno Richard Hauptmann, a carpenter who emigrated from Germany 11 years prior. Hauptmann's handwriting sample matched the ransom note, and more of the ransom money was traced back to him. He was charged with first-degree murder, tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. In 1936, Bruno Hauptmann was no more, having faced the same fatal consequences that he imposed on Charles Lindbergh Jr. The only silver lining of this heinous crime was that Congress enacted the Lindbergh Law in response to the atrocity, making kidnapping a federal offense if the victim is transported across state lines or if the mail or interstate commerce is used to elicit a ransom. Charles Lindbergh was an intensely private man, despite his worldwide celebrity status. After such an atrocious attack on his family that caused fear for the safety of his three-year-old son, Lindbergh decided to quietly leave the United States for England in December 1935. The Lindbergh family boarded a United States freighter as the only three passengers headed for Liverpool. For three years, the family lived in a rented home in Liverpool before again relocating to the Breton coast of France in 1938. It was during these years that Lindbergh's controversial political views began to emerge. Between 1936 
in 1938, in the years leading up to World War II, the U.S. military sent Charles Lindbergh to Germany to evaluate German aviation several times. By 1938, Lindbergh was friendly with top-ranking Nazi Party officials like Hermann Goering, Germany's air chief and one of Hitler's top advisors. That same year, Goering presented Lindbergh with the Commander Cross of the Order of the German Eagle, and Charles gladly accepted this prestigious honor. Accepting the award proved controversial due to the infamous Kristallnacht pogrom, essentially kick-starting the Holocaust just weeks later. When writing in his private diary, Lindbergh admitted that Germany had a serious Jewish problem, but he did not understand why they would attack Jewish businesses and homes so aggressively. In early 1939, U.S. General H. H. Arnold requested that Charles return to the United States to evaluate the American Army Air Corps readiness for war should such measures become necessary. Although he obeyed the orders of General Arnold, Lindbergh starkly opposed U.S. intervention in what he deemed a European conflict. In August 1939, Albert Einstein selected Lindbergh as the pilot needed to deliver an essential message to President Roosevelt, warning him about the destructive potential of nuclear fission. Lindbergh ignored Einstein's request, and days later, he delivered a radio address condemning U.S. intervention in the war. Lindbergh also sympathized with the German plight, as well as implying anti-Semitic, conspiratorial views about Jews controlling public perception of the war. Two months later, Lindbergh criticized Canada for supporting Britain in the fight against the Nazis and for dragging the Western Hemisphere into the so-called European War. By the end of the following year, Lindbergh was the spokesman for the America First Committee, a political action group focused on non-intervention in World War II. He delivered speeches to packed arenas across the United States with the message that three groups were to blame for pressing this country into war. The British, the Jews, and the Roosevelt administration. In response to this heavy criticism, President Roosevelt denounced Lindbergh's attitude toward war as cowardly and appeasing the Nazis, as well as questioning his loyalty to the American flag. In the face of such public criticism from the president, Lindbergh felt he had no choice but to step down from his military post. In addition to opposing the war against Germany, Lindbergh also had strong Nordicist and eugenicist ideals, and he spoke openly about how he felt certain races were superior to others. In one particularly alarming quote, Charles stated that, Racial strength is vital. Politics, a luxury. Furthermore, Henry Ford, the automobile tycoon and publisher of an anti-Semitic newspaper, famously stated, When Charles comes out here, we only talk about the Jews. While these racist viewpoints are deplorable to modern society, the unfortunate reality of the day was that Lindbergh's mindset about the existence of a racial hierarchy with Nordic races at the top was not uncommon and enjoyed social acceptance by many Americans. The attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 left the United States with no choice but to enter World War II. Lindbergh's ever-growing non-interventionist movement was derailed the moment Japanese bombs landed on that December morning in Hawaii. Despite his leaving military service, Lindbergh still wished to show his patriotism and support for the military during combat, so he offered his services as a consultant. Between 1942 and 1944, Lindbergh operated stateside, ironing out kinks in the production line for Ford's B-24 Liberator fighter plane, and then for United Aircraft as an engineering consultant. By 1944, Charles was itching to prove his worth in a true combat environment, and he persuaded United States aircraft to send him to the Pacific Theater to examine aircraft performance in combat conditions. Immediately showing his aviation knowledge was an asset, Charles taught combat pilots how to safely take off with a double payload of bombs. Lindbergh also demonstrated the safest technique for leaning fuel to increase the range fighters could fly on one gas tank, thus allowing for more long-distance bombing raids against the Japanese. These innovations were vital in a American success in reconquering the Pacific, and Lindbergh was tasked with teaching them to countless American fighter pilots. Lindbergh flew his first combat mission within months of arriving in the Pacific, despite holding no official rank or title. Charles subsequently flew 50 combat missions in the P-38 Lightning Fighter, on many of which he bombed targets and reportedly even shot down Japanese fighter planes. Charles and Anne Morrow Lindbergh had four more children after the war was over while living in Darien, Connecticut. Even some 20 years after his historic transatlantic crossing, Charles was in high demand and he only saw his children a few months out of the year. He served a number of enterprises as a consultant, from the chief of staff of the Air Force to the private company Pan American Airways. Later in life, Charles moved to Hawaii, where he focused his efforts on environmental causes such as protection of four endangered species, as well as the Maasai tribe in Nilotic Africa and the Tassidae people. 
people on the Philippine island of Mindanao. He also established a national park on the Hawaiian island of Maui. During the post-war period of Charles's life, he also made numerous trips to Europe in yet another controversial endeavor involving Germany. Between 1958 and 1967, Charles fathered seven additional children to three different mistresses in Germany, two of whom were sisters. These seven children were completely unaware of their father's true identity, as he would only visit them once or twice a year using the pseudonym Caro Ghent. Even when laying down on his deathbed, Charles wrote letters to his three German mistresses urging them to keep quiet about his real identity and adulterous behavior. It was not until over a decade after Charles Lindbergh's death in 1974 that his illegitimate daughter Astrid discovered her father's true identity by reading a magazine article about him. Shortly thereafter, she unearthed approximately 150 love letters from Lindbergh to her mother, along with some photographs too. DNA tests in 2003 confirmed Astrid's suspicion, and she made the news public, causing a media storm. In two separate chapters of Lindbergh's life, he engaged in secretive activities involving Germany. Whether the strong Nazi affiliations in the years leading to global conflict, or the seven unclaimed children he fathered two decades later, it is clear that there are certain aspects of Charles's life that he wished to keep private. Each time these events surfaced, they caused conflicting feelings among the American people about who Charles Lindbergh, the man, really was. In many cases, it is possible to detach a public celebrity from their personal activities, as Charles would have hoped. But as his dark secret spilled onto the front pages of the newspapers, this proved impossible for a man whose political and personal ideals cast a long shadow of doubt over such a full, achievement-rich life. And I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this a few times a week. And please do support our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace. They are linked to below. And thank you for watching.